For my money, there are few series finales as strong as King of the Hill's To Sirloin With Love. But if you're a big King of the Hill fan like me, you might also know that To Sirloin With Love wasn't actually the show's first attempt at a series finale. Back in season 11, it appeared as though the show was going to be cancelled by Fox, and so when the production team realized this, they decided that the episode Lucky's Wedding Suit would make a fitting series finale. That's why so many characters from the show's history show up to Luann's wedding, even if it doesn't make all that much sense that they would be there. But what I didn't realize until recently is that an entire additional sequence was animated for this potential series finale, and then scrapped when the show was renewed at the last minute. Recently, series writer and producer Jim Totrieve actually posted this original series finale in its entirety on Facebook, and let me tell you, it is absolutely fascinating and even includes a reveal that the entire show takes place over one single year. So today, I want to dive deep into what they originally wrote into the King of the Hill series finale, what this means for the series as a whole, and also what it could actually mean for the potential revival series that may be on the horizon. You ready? Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. But first, I want to thank today's video sponsor, Babbel. Learning a new language can be daunting, but there are so many reasons to expand your lingual skills. Not sure if you realize this, but I'm actually Italian. Yeah, Gianni Tuccello's, it's Italian. So I would love to visit Italy, but that will be so much easier for me if I learn a little bit of Italian first. So I've started doing Italian lessons via Babbel, which is such a great and versatile tool for learning language. The lessons are as short as 10 minutes a piece and can easily be integrated into even the busiest schedules. This tech is award-winning and has been proven to get people speaking a new language in just three weeks. Grazie. Grazie, signor Rossi. Babbel not only has a variety of ways to learn for people with different learning styles, such as lessons, podcasts, games, and videos, but they also provide real-world, practical conversation skills based on what you need best in your language journey. If you click the link in the description or scan the QR code, you can get 65% off your subscription to Babbel. Once again, if you use that link in the description, you'll get 65% off your subscription and can begin your language journey today. So like I said, this newly uncovered alternate ending for Lucky's wedding suit has some absolutely wild reveals and implications, but first, let's talk a bit about Lucky's wedding suit as a finale. While I don't think the episode itself is a great candidate for a final episode of the series, the final scene is really great. Luann is such a huge part of the show, and the entire series began with Luann moving in with the Hills. I appreciate that Luann getting married and officially starting her own family is a place where the show could have potentially ended. Plus, I've always loved when they use Mangione's Feel So Good at emotional moments in the show, and the transition from the wedding march into Chuck, it's excellent. I also appreciate this little emotional outburst from Hank. I've got, uh, well, I guess you'd call it emotions. There is a lot to like about how they executed these final moments. That being said, the original ending makes a lot more commentary on the series as a whole in super interesting ways. Apologies for the low quality video, for now all we've got is Jim Dotrieve's cell phone recording of the final version, but it's better than nothing. First of all, there's this wild revelation that I mentioned up top. Boy, I can't believe it was just a year ago that Luann's mama stabbed her daddy with a fork and she moved into our house. Feels like 10. So yeah, this alternate ending reveals that the entirety of the events of all 11 seasons of King of the Hill up to this point had taken place over a single year, despite the continuity that states otherwise. And this, I think, is a pretty funny bit, especially for an episodic sitcom that takes place in a floating timeline. Obviously, it can't possibly take into account the fact that there are multiple Thanksgiving and Christmas episodes, or the events that were pretty specific to the year they took place, like the election, but I still really appreciate this. Jim Dotri Treve actually talked about it in his Facebook post as well. I wrote the end scene you see here with the conceits that writers had often joked about that the entire series had taken place over one year, continuity be damned. So it's pretty clear to me that this was always sort of meant to be tongue in cheek, a way to acknowledge that the characters never age and have a fun reveal for the end of the series. The scene continues with some great shout outs to classic episodes and the context of them all taking place in the same year is very funny. We had a twister and a flood, we burned down the fire station, Bobby burned down our church, Unless we forget, the Megalomart blew up and killed Buckley and darn near killed you, Hank. So this is referencing the episodes Texas City Twister, Après Hank Le Deluge, A Firefighting We Will Go, Revenge of the Ludafisk, and Propane Boom Parts 1 and 2. I love that they've just highlighted all of the craziest stuff that's happened in Arlen over the series. It all sounds so absurd when listed back to back. They continue to allude to the greatest hits and list all of Hank's various ailments throughout the series, and then they say something really interesting. Remember that time I stole the tank from the army base? That never happened. 
And I wasn't born in a bathroom at Yankee Stadium while Cotton tried to kill Castro with a blow dart. The clip goes on to explain that these episodes were actually just vivid dreams that Bill had after eating at a Hungarian restaurant in McMainerberry. So this is wildly fascinating. Basically, at the 11th hour, the writing staff decided to decanonize a couple of major episodes in the show. Jim Dotrieve talked about this too. We even bought back some of the events of the series. For instance, Bill stealing a tank. Mike Judge never really liked that as he felt it was too big and kind of shark jumpy. And native Texan that I am, I never liked Hank being born in New York. So for one, it's really interesting to hear some of the regrets that Mike Judge and the writers may have had over the course of the show's entire run. I really love the episodes they mentioned personally, but the fact that they were going to completely decanonize them is really wild. It's interesting. And I actually think it also probably speaks to how Judge & Co. might approach the upcoming King of the Hill revival if it ever gets off the ground, which I expect it will. It seems very possible that for a revival, they could pick and choose which stuff they maintain continuity with. Will they ignore or decanonize the fact that Hank was born in New York? Would they bring back Cotton even though he dies in season 12? Is there anything they might change continuity-wise to address the loss of Brittany Murphy and Tom Petty as Luann and Lucky? Mike Judge also recently brought back Beavis and Butthead, which is great by the way, but that show went a very interesting route with how they modernized it. The film, Do the Universe, actually went to great lengths to explain how Beavis and Butthead moved from 1998 to 2022 via a wormhole. But despite this, when the show returned and the duo lived in 2022, they still just brought back all the same characters from the old series at the same ages they existed in back in 1998. No real explanation why. So it seems like Judge is willing to fudge the timeline for the stories he wants to tell. Granted, I know King of the Hill is much more reliant on story and continuity than Beavis and Butthead, but it's still, I think, a worthwhile precedent to look at. Okay, let's dive back into this alternate finale because there are a lot of things to love about the way they wrapped this up. After the bit about Bill's vivid decanonizing dreams, they start to list off some of the wilder things that have happened over the series once again. Heck, I wish it was a dream when I got arrested for fishing with crack, or when Peggy had pictures of her feet taken for perverts, or when Bobby was a husky boy clothes model. I think what I love about this little sequence is specifically the way the gang smiles as they think back fondly on all of these events. It mirrors us as the audience, remembering how fun and ridiculous those episodes could be, just as our time in Arlen is coming to a close. It's really nice. Yeah, that boy ain't right, but he's a good kid. All in all, it's been a pretty good run this year, I tell you what. But I think the nicest touch here is everything that follows. The gang gives their usual yeps. Hank feels the back of his neck where a mosquito sits, flying off. The camera pans up, 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 all the way to the Arlen Water Tower, where the series would have ended. This final shot perfectly mirrors the pilot episode's opening shot, which pans down from a sky-high view of Arlen until a mosquito comes into view, which then lands on Hank's neck as he smacks it with his hand a beautiful and symbolic way to end the series. Now, like I said, Lucky's wedding suit certainly would not be my choice as a series finale, but I have to give them credit for what they pulled off in this added finale sequence. It does some really fun stuff, references back to the series with admiration, and beautifully mirrors the opening of the show. I still think To Sirloin With Love is a much better finale. In fact, it's about as perfect of a series finale as you can have, but I really appreciate their first attempt here, even if fate had different plans. And before any of you comment, Yes, To Sirloin With Love is the series finale, not another Manic Conde. The show was cut short by four episodes on Fox, and they burned off the remaining four in syndication, so though they aired afterwards, To Sirloin With Love was always meant to be the series finale. Every time I refer to it as the finale, I get comments arguing that it isn't. It is, I promise. But wow, I had no idea this alternate ending existed until recently. It's a shame that all we've got for the moment is this cell phone record of a screen, but Jim does say he's working on a better transfer, so hopefully Hopefully we get that one day. It really is a fascinating piece of King of the Hill history, and absolutely one of the most interesting things I've ever seen hit the cutting room floor in just about anything. In an alternate universe, this aired as the series finale for King of the Hill, and while I don't think it's quite as satisfying as the ending of To Sirloin With Love, I do think it made a really valiant effort, and leaves me feeling pretty good at the end. And if you want to see this alternate finale clip uninterrupted in full, I'll put a link in the description of this video so you can check it out yourself. But what do y'all think? Did you know anything about this alternate series finale? Do you prefer it to the finale we ultimately got in season 13? Do you think this might point to continuity changes if the show is ever revived? Let me know below in the comments, and of course, let me know what King of the Hill topic you want me to talk about next. Peace! Johnny!
Thank you.